follow that. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's such an honour and pleasure to be here. And, and like Richard said earlier, it's just, it feels like you can't have a wedding meet seeing all your old friends. Um, and in fact, it's been such a sunny day, but it's been a cloud gathering on my horizon as the day has gone on thinking, I've got to finish off and say something at the end of all these amazing presentations. Just to pick up uh, Patrick's um, slight mistake, um, in some of the early conversations about the G 100,000 Genomes Project, I actually asked them to correct the minutes because I was worried that SJB, when Sally did the report in history, was going to be attributed to me. So, so it was interesting that you made the mistake as well. Um, so um, I chose for my title Rhetoric to Reality, which to some extent plays off the back of what Claire's just been saying. Um, and again, on this journey, if you like, from genetics to genomic medicine. So. Um, 1969, I'm looking for competition here. I actually entered the field of genetics in 1969, though I didn't quite appreciate at the time that I'd done it. Our, our biology teacher took us to Lumley Castle in a bus, and we listened to a man from Oxford explain the genetic code, which had just been cracked not long before then. And I was fascinated, and my biology teacher asked me to explain it to him again on the way back on the bus, which was very cool. And so... Um, <laughs> I was, I, was, I was fascinated by this discovery, but I was actually more fascinated by Linda, my new girlfriend, um, who three years later I married, and I'm still married to. Uh, and in fact, when I married her, I'd just taken a year out of my medical course to do a degree in genetics. Uh, and 10 years after that, I was working at Great Ormond Street, where I think I bumped into uh, a young Sally the Registrar at one point. Um, and uh, we just started doing DNA stuff. We were using a restriction enzyme to diagnose sickle cell disease carriers, which was very cool. And I got a letter from the Royal College of Physicians saying that I was now a clinical geneticist. And it didn't have a date on it, I'm very pleased to say. I actually got revalidated last week, so I'm still a clinical geneticist. <laughs> um, so while thinking about this, as this conference was looming, I was trying to think what do I talk about? The trouble is, having been in this game for 50 years, there's a lot of stories to tell. Um, and I thought just to, I just started thinking through, and in fact, Ron, uh, Ron reminded me of one that I'd forgotten, which is the Human Genetics Commission. But these were all the things that I got involved in from 1982 onwards. And you can see, I'm not going to talk about them all, obviously, uh, except one. Um, but you can see the word genetics keeps cropping up. So I was a geneticist. I was, you know, this is the, the city where the word was coined by William Bates, and this is the study of familial traits, the things that run in families. And, and that quote from Sally was really trying to make the point that the geneticists were not were primarily looking at families with conditions, not actually chasing bits of DNA. Uh, and I got more and more drawn in to this whole debate. I've highlighted there the one that doesn't say genetics but hereditary because I was very proud to spend about seven years persuading a bunch of recalcitrant researchers to join up and form a single society, which I only got Hans Varsen in the Netherlands to join if we kept the name of his institute in the title, and he worked in the Institute for Hereditary Tumours. So I sat and worked out this acronym, which kept his title in, and so the International Society for Hereditary uh, Gastrointestinal Tumours, I've missed out there, insight was formed. And the reason that's relevant to the variant thing is the one thing that we did in my first presidency was get together the three teams around the world who were actually collecting variants in... Um, in these genes that we're, I'm going to talk about. Uh, and so wouldn't it be a good idea if we had one list instead of three lists? And so we created the Insight Database, which is now a recognised expert group uh, in ClinVar. So that was uh, a bit of a score. In the second half, so I was trying to remember when I got into genomics. And again, it was actually here in 1994 when I brought our daughter for her interviews. And I took her around to see Watson and Crick's shed in between her interviews and they just announced the Millennium Commission and they wanted to have ideas for people to spend lots of money from the lottery and I said we could build a gene dome uh, and so on the way back on the train my daughter and I designed the gene dome which became the Centre for Life which became one of those genetic knowledge parks and that was when I really started thinking about genomics but increasingly got drawn into that world and particularly through the Human Variome Project started by Dick Cotton where we're just trying to get all these variants together in all of these genes. And then 
uh, down at the bottom there, I've now not, I haven't learnt my lessons, I've now become Vice President of Hugo, and in fact I'm wearing the tie that Victor McCusick, the first President of Hugo, gave me uh, a few years ago. So I, I thought rather than, uh, you've seen lots of um, sweeping presentations through the day, so I want to tell you about one that, that Sue referred to, and I'm going to say, by the way, you're going to listen to this, you're all tired. You're only going to remember the last slide, which is my tribute to Sue. Um, but it was, um, she mentioned on her, one of her slides about Lynch syndrome. So I just want to talk about Lynch syndrome and as a worked example of the challenge that we face. So Ted here, I met in 1992 on the ward, dying in fact from his third now metastatic colon cancer. And he'd had nine skin cancers and his sister Bertha had had endometrial cancer. And we were trying to find this elusive condition that was called hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer. Uh, and this was clearly a family worth pursuing. And with uh, Tim Bishop's team in Leeds, we managed to map this to chromosome 2, whereupon the yeast geneticist arrived and said, have you got any DNA from one of these families? We said, yeah, we've got some. And so we sent it over to Richard Kolodner's group, and they just beat the Vogelstein group to find the MSH2 gene and published it in Cell and forgot to put our names on the paper. But we're not cross. Um, but, <laughs> but what that gave us was a diagnostic test for hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer. Now, the reason this was important to me then was we just launched my big idea in FAP, familial polyposis, which was these are the canaries down the mine. The people who've got a gene for bowel cancer, why don't we try stuff on them that might reduce the risk? And there were two things that we learnt from the literature might be worthwhile, aspirin and high fibre or resistant starch. So as soon as we asked this was discovered, I realised we were looking at the wrong disease. Teenagers are really hard to work with, as you can imagine, and grown-ups who get cancer would be much more interested for our study. So meanwhile, we started collecting Lynch syndrome, and I'm just fast forward a moment, because my friend Paul Muller set up the Prospective Lynch Syndrome database, which we all poured some data into. We have about 8,500 people with Lynch syndrome now in that database to try and deal with one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse to which Claire referred, which is this bias of ascertainment. So Paul very cleverly said, what we need to do is prospectively follow these patients. So anybody who'd been entered into screening could now be followed prospectively to see what happens next. And this graph demonstrates why these people are worthy of attention, because from the age of about 25 onwards, at about 2% per annum, they get cancer, and they often get, as you saw with Ted, lots of cancers. So by the age of 75, 80, about 80% of the MSH2 gene carriers will have had at least one cancer, and many will have died of it because we didn't get to them in time. Um, we've now, this is now an interactive database, so this is personalised medicine, so if you've got the gene, you can put in your gene, your age and everything else, and it'll tell you what your risk is for the next decade. And we now know that about 3 per 1,000 people carry a pathogenic variant in this gene or the other three genes out of the mismatch repair system, which are, in, these are basically your body spell checker. You're all sitting doing it all the time, as indeed are the bacteria in your gut. Everybody uses these genes to spell check their DNA as it's being copied. And if you uh, don't have two working copies of one of these genes, then you're in trouble. We estimate, we don't know exactly because we don't know what the life expectancy is, but maybe about 150,000 people in this country have Lynch syndrome. And now, after 30 years, we know about 10,000 of them. So we are way off the pace in managing this very high risk <coughs> population. So this is, um, if, if I was a chef, this would be my signature dish slide. Um, so this is 30 years on from that hunch. Why, why don't we recruit? a thousand people with Lynch syndrome and give them either aspirin or placebo and resistant starch or cornstarch and we did and we eventually uh, they only were treated for four up to four years and this is the definitive result so we gave two aspirins a day for two years on average to these people and at the end of 15 years the colorectal cancer risk was reduced by 55 percent and it's still not showing any signs of converging. So we did something to their predisposition to cancer, which made a big difference. That actually won prizes at ASCO and all sorts of stuff. The other half of the trial, we then tried to publish, and it didn't show an impact on colorectal cancer, which we thought it should have done. But we could talk about the biology of that later. 
But we also had as a secondary endpoint all the other cancers these patients get. And when we counted them, to our amazement, 60% fewer other cancers in the people to whom we gave 30 grams of resistant starch. The ref referees tore us to pieces, but we eventually beat them down and then got published um, in Cancer Prevention Research, got a front cover and got a prize from them as well for their best paper of the year. So the refereeing process is an interesting one. So we've now got two interventions that can half the risk of cancer in these patients for peanuts. So problem solved. Well, not quite. First of all, I knew when we started people on two aspirins a day that people would be anxious about the dose. Now, I'm an old doctor. When I was a boy, we used to put people on three aspirins a day to start with and build them up to three grams a day, but we had to stop if they got ringing in their ears. So, so basically, two aspirins a day is peanuts. It is actually a low dose, but nowadays, of course, it's perceived to be a high dose. So we set up another trial, in, inspirationally called CAP3, um, and we, we randomised. We were in for 2,000. We got 1,879 people, and we gave them aspirin in three doses, blind for two years, and then we kept them on the dose for a public, as an open label for another three years. Now, you could say that... Uh, um, um, some of the experts in the room say, ah, you've gone open label. But the point is, we, all of these people are logged into the National Disease Registration Service. So we know what cancers they're going to get. And, and the fact that they know what dose of aspirin they're on will not influence our finding of whether they've got cancer or not. We're not counting polyps. We don't care about polyps. We only care about cancer. So in fact, Nick was a, the first person to join, and we are, um, and we are now approaching... The last, five, the last patient, last visit next, next year, so we'll have an analysis of this in about a year and 18 months' time. And the question is, do you get the same level of protection from a baby aspirin as you do from two aspirins a day? And I can't tell you the answer yet, because I don't know. But we fortunately, of course, have all those other thousands of Lynch patients who are in the National Disease Registration Service, and as of last year, we've now got Section 254, which means we can track all people with Lynch syndrome even if they haven't had cancer yet. So we've got a baseline, effectively a controlled population, which is great. I should say we set that up in five countries. We set up CAP2 to find those 1,000 patients in 16 countries in 43 centres. That's now virtually impossible because of the increased regulation uh, of, of clinical trials. And in fact, CAP3, we got the aspirin free from Bayer, but it cost us £1.2 million to put it in packets so that we could dispense it to the patient. So trialling is an expensive game. Now, this is, not the, on this is the only kind of um, aspirin prevention of cancer, apart from the Women's Health Study. The only two trials that have shown that aspirin works, but there are at least 100 papers that say that taking regular aspirin will significantly reduce your risk of colorectal cancer. In fact, we did an anal analysis led by Jack Kuzik five years ago which reckoned that if, if all people between 50 and 60 took aspirin uh, and then stopped, then we would reduce the national mortality by 4%. And yet, we can't get it prescribed still. And so Kelly Lloyd, who's on a PhD studentship from our ASCAP um, uh, CIUK programme grant, has been doing a very formal in, uh, investigation of GPs. And the take, key take-home was that one in five GPs would be unwilling to prescribe aspirin to these patients, despite the fact we have Lynch guidance, uh, sorry, we have, Lynch, we have nice guidance that Lynch patients should be recommended to take aspirin. It's not an indication, it's a recommendation because we need a pharmaceutical company to push it through to indication and Bayer never got a license for their patent for aspirin in Britain. So there's no one in Britain to drive this through. So I, I'd, I'd like some support from this august audience to get it into the British national formulary. Also, aspirin is dangerous. Well, it's not. Actually, in the under 60s, aspirin is as dangerous and slightly, slightly less dangerous than colonoscopy, which people do at the drop of a hat. So the other problem here is that, of course, you've got to treat these people for five years before anything happens. So you only get the side effects for the first five years, which is a bit of a downside. So this is the, the database I referred to earlier from Insight. So we've at least now started to track down all the people. But it's, this is still a work in progress, as Claire has, has alluded to. We have thousands of variants. And in fact, in, in our BRCA database, which we created with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, we've got 68,000 variants in BRCA1 and BRCA2. And a very large proportion of them are VUSs. Uh, which one of our friends described as a very unhelpful statement. Um, 
and we spend our lives trying to work out what the US has mean. So we've now got, as I said, we've now got this picked up by ClinVar, so it's fun, funded by ClinGen, which is great. And the LOVD is the database attached to the Human Variant Project, which now has about a billion variants in it. Uh, and these are, uh, it's a, a, um, everyone can have the software for free to gather their variants of interest. Oops, sorry. So the good thing about Lynch syndrome is we've got a functional test. So when your mismatch repair breaks down, you can either stain for the missing proteins or you can look for microsatellite instability. This is, these are repetitive bits of DNA that pick up spelling mistakes very easily. The trouble is that the assay that everybody uses, the one in the top right-hand corner there, uh, is called Oncomid. It uses five very big fragments, which you can't sequence in a next-gen sequencer. So you've got to use the old-style religion to analyze them. And you get these things called stutter peaks on the PCR. So you've got to actually have an expert eye to differentiate what's normal and what's abnormal. Of course, you can deduce microsatellite instability from sequencing, but that costs a lot. And if you're sequencing biopsies, you'll get at least a 10% fail rate, and it takes a while. So we decided, why don't we invent a new test using small repeats that you can actually analyze and sequence on the next-gen sequencer? Uh, and so we did that. And in fact, what we did was we used the cancer, cancer genome to pull out interesting variants. But then we also did whole genome sequencing on these very rare children who inherit Lynch syndrome from both parents and start getting cancer as infants. And we looked to see which were the fragments that were most likely to go wrong in their bloodstream as a liquid biopsy and deduced that they would probably be the most useful markers for testing tumours for this feature of microsatellite instability. And so it proved to be. I'm not going to present you with all the data. It works. And we got a great grant from NHS England to roll this out and scale it up. Um, meanwhile, we also set about with NDRS, the National Disease Registration Service, to see how we were doing across the board with MSI testing. So with Bowel Cancer UK, we did a freedom, freedom of information in our, uh, request, and then that led in to uh, a more formal study, which we're about to publish, and Claire and I are authors, along with Fiona Mac MacRonald and colleagues at NDRS. But essentially, in 2019, this is from the paper that's not yet, this is unpublished, there were 37,662 colorectal cancers in England. About 3,000 of those should have got through our pathway of MSI testing or immunohistochemistry, followed by a secondary molecular test to rule out some of the sporadics. In fact, 210 people with colon cancer in our country, two years after it was nice guidance to do this, actually got referred. And the mean time to a test result was 286 days. Now, given that knowing that you've got Lynch syndrome is quite valuable when you have your operation, never mind for your family, that's not really very good. And there's the actual scatter, and you can see that some of our results, the germline test, was coming back 900 days later. So this is where rhetoric hits reality. We weren't delivering, and we needed to up, up our game. So this is the bottom line of what we call the MSI plus assay, and I have to say my name is on the patents from our university. But because we're using multiple small markers which are highly informative with a Bayesian algorithm, we can basically give you a yes-no answer. So Lizzie, who is the bioinformatician now in Manchester, was in Sheffield, who produced this. This is what the scientist sees. So our technologist does this now. The scientists don't even look at it. And so basically, we don't need an expert pathologist. We don't need a scientist to interpret which bump's real. It just goes straight out. And it basically says, here is a dot, and it's microsatellite unstable. It's not MSI high, because there's no such thing as MSI low. That's just an artifact. Uh, and BRAF is positive. Now, this is a mutation which drives cancer, and is almost never seen in Lynch syndrome. So its presence means we're not going to pursue this one as a potential Lynch case. And you've got QC to say that the result was good. So we've now got this running across our entire region. All the colorectal surgeons send in their, all the pathologists send in their biopsies, three slices, seven-day turnaround, and they get a letter back saying, test this one for Lynch, don't test that one. And it's getting better. So Patricia was our master student who's been running this whole program on her own, basically. Um, and from May 21 to 20 November, we had a turnaround 235. You can see that we've got down, so in May to November of last year, we were down to 134 days. But crucially, in Northumbria, which is one of our good district general hospitals, they've now started 
to mainstream fully. So basically, if someone get, if it comes back as MSI high, BRAF negative, then it's the nurse team that collect the blood for germ, germ, germline testing, and we get sent them if it's, uh, to get the result. So essentially, that reduces it to 104 days, with an average of 21 days between the MSI high report being sent to the hospital and the germline test being activated. So this is streamlining and mainstreaming in, in motion, and hopefully we can spread this, and we've now, with the support of NHS England, got technologists into Manchester, Birmingham, Bristol, and support into the Marsden to try and roll this out. The good news is uh, this assay works on all tumours, and the even better news is the discovery of the immune checkpoint inhibitors. T cells are lethal, and they've got these inhibitors on them to stop them killing everything, but if you actually block those inhibitors with these various drugs, then what happens is the T cells just go out and kill anything they can find. And these tumours are incredibly immunogenic. So if you take one of these drugs, it just wipes these tumours out. So we've now got an intervention that's really effective, not just in Lynch syndrome, but in any microsatellite unstable cancer. So now we've got the pharmaceutical industry on side because there are at least 100 trials now running for MSI high cancers. So maybe we'll get this one into play and maybe as a result we'll find more of those uh, missing Lynch patients. So what are the lessons learned? Well, we've got to keep improving the offer. When we first designed this assay, it was a two-day preparation. It was a bit of a Clark using invasion probes. We've now got a dead simple multiplex, automatable one-day turnaround. You've got to look at the whole pathway. It's not good enough to fix the bit in the middle. You've got to think about the samples coming in and the results going out. You've got to keep pushing because people will give up on this in a, in a stressed environment that we live in. And obviously you use, use the early adopters to convert the sceptics. Um, healthcare systems differ, but champions of change are always needed. You need the innovators to just drive this forward. And genomic medicine cannot depend only on the genetic services. It has to be adopted. There's, hand, there's only a handful of us. It's crazy to send all the people with a gene problem to the geneticists. It's very obvious. The other thing is, though, that new diagnostics are really hard to get into the air. We've been working on this now for several years. And we, because of COVID, we still haven't finalized the UCAS accreditation, which is happening in June. But now Europe have given us IVDR which is a nightmare. You've got to get through notified bodies. It's about another year before we could sell this assay outside of the NHS. FDA used to be horrible. It's actually now better than Europe, the FDA 510. So these are real barriers to getting these assays into, into process. And finally, global priorities vary. So we think this is all really important stuff, BRCA and mismatch repair. But in, when we had meetings of our global variome group, they said, my friends in Africa and Asia said, well, this is all very well, but this isn't what you know, worries us. Um, and so this is actually from a slide I did from the International Congress last week on behalf of Ar uh, Ada Hamosh, who is our new president at Hugo, of which Global Variome is now part. Uh, and we've set up this Bracker Exchange, which is great, but the Global Globin Network is what's really got the colleagues around the world excited. Because I remember I said in 1982, we had a test for carriers for sickle cell disease. We haven't got there yet in Africa and Asia. There are literally hundreds of thousands of kids dying of thalassemia and sickle cell disease still. These are manageable, avoidable conditions that we're not getting ahead of. Uh, and so that's the team, including Antonis, who's in the room, uh, that set up the BRCA challenge. Um, but here is the team of people from Asia and Africa who want to talk about thalassemia and sickle cell disease because these are still a problem and we still don't fully understand their management. We still aren't rolling out effective carrier testing and interventions. So what we have to remember is that the rest of the world uh, thinks about, global, about genomics in a slightly different way. So these are some of the many people who made all of this possible, but I want to end with this slide. I think Sue probably vaguely remembers this reference. So those of you who've had children's parties will have made a, a jelly and put it in the fridge. And then you get it out the next day. And the thing about a jelly is it looks quite fragile, but you can hit it with a spatula and it goes, uh, and then it looks exactly the same. Just like the NHS. <laughs> And so seven years ago, I was in a conference like this, speaking alongside Sue Hill, and I said, the good news is that the chief accountable officer is Sue Hill, and she's the best jelly slapper in the business. <laughs> Thank you for your attention.